welcome to module eight of machine learning. Uh, this is the last module of, of this two day course. And we're gonna try and wrap things up. As per usual, everything in this module and all parts of this course are under a Creative Commons license, which is essentially share and share alike with uh, attribution. So this module along with the previous one is, is focusing on using machine learning with Keras and Scikit-learn. So this is essentially to try and demonstrate how you can use these powerful modules um, or um, systems that are available through, through Google um, to make your uh, life easier when you're trying to do machine learning. We've already shown how we could use Keras and Scikit-learn for uh, the iris classification problem. Uh, here, what we're gonna try and do is is demonstrate how we can use it in uh, the secondary structure prediction uh, with an artificial neural net. And then we're also gonna show how we can use um, HMM Learn, which is not really scikit-learn, but it is a, a branch uh, to do uh, prokaryote and promoter motif um, recognition. So a little more advanced, uh, a little more challenging, I guess, than the simple iris ones. But um, again, this is just to simply show you the feasibility of taking um, a real bioinformatics problem with real bioinformatics data and, and to use uh, SKLearn, Keras, HMMLearn, and others. And we're going to do this, and you'll see this not only for the Python work, but we'll also see this in R. Now, what I also want to highlight, and, and Francis brought this up, so we have a, about an hour here where we're going to go through both this lecture and lab. And then we're going to leave about the last 15 minutes. Um, so that'll be at 5.45 for everyone, or about an hour from now, um, so that people can uh, complete the survey and uh, provide any feedback. Uh, it's also time to answer anyone's questions. Um, I know that people have obligations, and we'll try and wrap everything up uh, by 6 o'clock, uh, or as close to that as possible. So. Um, Again, um, module four yesterday, we looked at uh, secondary structure and we used prediction with artificial neural networks. Um, so we had a program called SSN or SAN, uh, dot I P Y N B. Now this is gonna be SAN Keras, I P N Y B. Um, so this is where we're using Keras. The structure of this is similar to what we did, which is how do I predict protein secondary structure from sequence data? So that's our question, that's our problem. Uh, we're going to use uh, the same training data testing set that we talked about before, and that's the PPTDB. Um, this is uh, an example of that, the protein sequence name, um, secondary structure, um, and we can use this in this format. The actual code uh, for this Keras module is, um, is in module 8. Um, and you can open it up, click on it, and you can see the, the Keras version of it. Uh, make sure you look for Keras. Um, that's important to distinguish um, from other versions of SAN. Now, if you open it up um, and, and look in it, um, even as I'm speaking or maybe during the lab, you'll see that it's very similar. It uses NumPy and Pandas. Um, both for the mathematical operations, array handling, and data frame. Um, we are um, reading um, a converted data set as a comma-separated file. Um, we're processing it exactly the same way as we did uh, the last time. Uh, we're taking amino acid sequence, secondary structure. Uh, we're checking for any non-standard amino acids. Um, we're cleaning up um, any other information where uh, things are out of range. So all of that uh, data check, which is what we also did in module four, is being done here with this program. Uh, missing values and label checks are also there just to make sure everything is complete. Again, nothing different than before. Uh, we're going to create a, a training set of 70% and a testing set of 30%. 
um, code is very similar. So same split data set test train function that we've used in, in all of our other uh, data sets. So that's all a repeat, and it's probably not worth going into detail. Um, in terms of uh, transforming the data set and selecting features, we're going to do the, exactly the same thing uh, because it is still going to require some uh, one-hot encoding. So this is something that's you know not automatic, um, and, and knowing how to do one-hot encoding or coming up with schema for one-hot encoding is something that you, you pretty much always have to do regardless of whether you're using Keras or not. Um, so this is how we're encoding. Um, and uh, it's 21 characters. Uh, we're trying to convert essentially character uh, numbers or hexadecimal type characters into something that's uh, a binary. And we're, we're dealing with 20 amino acids. So it'd be 20 characters and then a null amino acid, uh, which gives it to 21. And uh, we're just going from A, C, D, E, F, G, H, K, and so on all the way through the 20 amino acids. We also one hot encode the secondary structure. Um, so we're using three um, binary numbers, 100, 010, 001. Um, same thing as what we've done with the amino acid uh, encoding alphabet. Um, we give a unique binary number. Um, this is the, essentially the way that we write it out to make sure we get uh, 21 different numbers associated with every single amino acid. Same thing is done uh, to create the binary for the secondary structure. So that's the code. We're padding uh, with the sequence as we did yesterday in module four. So we're adding um, eight extra amino acids uh, at the N terminus and eight extra amino acids at the C terminus and they're all given the character null. This is because we're using a window of 17 residues. And so this ensures that we'll always be able to predict some secondary structure, either the first or the last residue. Um, we have um, a window size that we've identified for 17. Um, we're transforming the amino acids into their binary representation as well, which was what we talked about before. Uh, padding to make sure that things have the binary code um, so that they're 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, um, um Windowing, again, this is just sliding the 17 things along. It's also trying to convert the 17 times 21, so whatever that is, uh, 368 or whatever um, elements. Um, we fetch uh, the protein sequence and uh, assign each one to a secondary structure character. So that's the standard setup. That's what we had to do um, previously for the secondary structure prediction. So if you look at the code um, from module four, that first half of it will be essentially identical. And again, that just emphasizes the fact that yes, scikit-learn is great. Yes, um, Keras is great, but you still have to do some coding to set things up. And if you if you don't design it properly, um, you can't really run these programs. So that's why we spent a fair bit of time talking about uh, one-hot encoding, uh, converting things, even some aspects of, of normalization and scaling, which um, we didn't have to do for this one, but we would have had to have done with the um, uh, flower work. So um, I guess it's 357 units, that's 21 times 17. Um, we're, what we did um, in the neural network um, from yesterday with module four, we had relatively few hidden layers with Keras, uh, we can actually play um, a little bit more. We can actually have more than one hidden layer. We can have three, five, ten if we want. And as I, I mentioned before, with the deep neural nets, and because um, you can make use of some of the GPU and, and sort of some of the horsepower at, on Google um, and the cloud, you can go 
um, a little further out. And, and you'll see that although it's subtle, um, using extra layers and using the architecture or strength of deep neural nets, you can get a, a, a modest performance improvement. So just as we did before um, with the neural net, we have to import um, some uh, libraries. Uh, we're importing dense and sequential. Um, so dense is um, the framework and or is the layer type and sequential is the framework model for that. Um, so we import them. Um, we call the sequential function, uh, which is you know, set classifier to sequential. Uh, and then we start adding um, layers. Um, and like the iris example, we're also going to be using um, the ReLU activation function, at least for the first hidden layer. So more we add, um, in this case, we're, um, I think there's six layers that we're adding. Um, so we're making this a fairly deep neural net. Um, and then uh, with uh, compile, um, and fit, we can start um, choosing what we want to do in terms of the batch size, the number of epochs, um, what our uh, function loss, in this case it's cross entropy, how we're measuring in terms of accuracy or error measurements, um, gradient descent optimization, which is the atom function, all of those things can be invoked. So the, the neural net um, is essentially very similar or almost identical to the one we use for the iris, but the key difference obviously is in how we structured the data. So setting that data up uh, so that we could put that in and it could be properly read and the output could be properly interpreted. Um, we have to have the predict um, function and um, we take our input data uh, and then the resulting array is, is kicked out. Uh, I'm not sure why, and I guess I've seen this in a few slides where the resolution on the image has sort of just vanished. <laughs> um, and, and perhaps uh, Life and Louisa, maybe after this uh, course, you guys can just go through and figure out what happened to some of these screenshots, why they just suddenly went blurry. Um, anyways, what happens is that this produces uh, a collection of probabilities of whether percentage of B which is beta strand, C for coil, H for helix. Uh, and we can take the prediction, which whatever wins. Um, in this case, apparently 90%, although none of us can read it, um, that the structure associated with this particular uh, residue is a coil. Um, we can also generate the confusion matrix um, and determine how we did against the actual structures um, in terms of the actual training or test set. And so this is uh, just a comparison between what, what we predicted and what we saw. So overall, outside of having to do the sort of the, the reading, checking, uh, one hot encoding, uh, the calls to uh, the neural net using Keras um, are certainly simplify the whole calculation. It, it's, um, what would have been 100 lines, it's reduced to about 10 lines. So in case you don't remember, uh, this is what we got on our test set um, from yesterday's um, super or secondary structure artificial neural net or SAN. Um, it's, um, you're mostly interested in the diagonal. So 46% for beta, 69% for coil, 65% for helix. Given the overall abundance, um, you can calculate a Q3 for this, and the Q3 I think is around 61 or 62%, um, which is okay, but not great. So if we go to the next slide, um, beta isn't quite as good, so 46 to 43, but what uh, has improved is the coil percentage has gone up to 70%, and uh, helix has gone up to 65% or 66%. And um, some of the off predictions are slightly reduced. So with the Keras, using um, a, a deeper neural net, um, there's a modest improvement. Um, 
probably in the Q3 score. Um, but this is, I guess, the advantage of the fact that when you have uh, deeper nets, um, more subtle patterns are detected. Now, if we compare um, the Python uh, secondary structure neural net with Keras, um, it had about 270 lines, um, or consisting of about 270 lines, or about 240 actual coding ones. Uh, it runs about 54 seconds. Um, the R version um, is actually a little shorter and actually much faster overall uh, than the Python one. Um, compared to the original um, pure uh, Python one that we wrote, the, the code length is uh, modestly shorter uh, for the Python with Keras. Um, and uh, I guess, obviously simpler to implement. So what we've got at least now is a set of both um, an R program uh, where we use deep nets R functions or a Python program where we use the Keras functions. They've been tested on um, a training set of about 490 proteins, just like the one that we did on, on module four. And then the test set was about 210. Um, as, as I think we highlighted yesterday and even today, you could reuse the code um, with the, the Keras functions uh, or with the deep net functions. Uh, you could apply it to membrane spanning predictions, signal site prediction, other things. Now, this, like uh, our module seven, uh, we're going to have a, a little lab in the middle of the uh, lecture. And so, again, I just wanted people to pull out um, SAN and to um, do what we've always done before. In this case, we're going to go to module eight. Uh, open up the code and you can either get the, the Keras version or you can get the deep net version um, from R. Uh, you can open them up, you can start browsing, looking to see what, what they're like. We'd also encourage you to look maybe at module four just to compare the code between the two. Um, look at the differences, look at the similarities. Um, again, you can run the program um, and uh, upload the data. In this case, it's converted data.csv, which is the same data set that we'd used uh, yesterday. Again, run all through the runtime menu. And then we have various instructions where you can go to different cells, change things, add layers, um, um, run uh, things with different numbers of layers or no hidden layers, see what happens, what your optimal performance is. The next part that we wanted to look at um, after the secondary structure prediction was to go to essentially what we did this morning, which was the hidden Markov motif analysis. And in this case, um, we're not using scikit-learn, we're using HMM-learn. So it is a Python library. Um, and um, it's similar to Keras, but specifically done for hidden Markov models. Um, so just like how Keras makes it really easy to um, build neural nets. HMM does uh, the same for, for hidden Markov models. So same pathway that we always have talked about, same color scheme. In this case, we're going to try and identify motifs from unaligned sequence data. Um, so if you recall from hidden Markov models, we could use alignments, and that would save us uh, time. But to make it more challenging, um, we're just sort of using a uh, collection of sequence, um, which consisted of 800, 1,805 promoter sequences with known transcription start sites, covering the first 50 um, nucleotides before the, the transcription start set. Um, so it's the same set that we used with our Python HMM. Um, same data, we have forward strand data, we have reverse strand data or reverse complement so that we can always read five prime to three prime um, to make things consistent. So if you wanted to take a look at the, the, the code, uh, again, it's in module eight. You can look at either the Python or the R code. Um, so we have uh, 
uh, the HMF motif with HMM learn um, in Python. So uh, as before, uh, or we can import uh, NumPy and Pandas. Um, so this is to help with the math and the data handling. Um, we're going to read uh, our collection of motif sequences. If it's a comma separated file, we use drop and a uh, to help sort things out. So again, it's pretty much identical. Um, so we've got our data set. We've read our data set. Um, now we're going to transform it and select. So this is where we have to do the encoding. Uh, and we talked about that before. It's the same thing, converting um, letters to numbers, because uh, computers can handle numbers. And uh, we've done this for all of the, the sequence um, in our set. Um, so pretty much everything to now is what we did previously um, for handling uh, the HMM on, in module five. Um, we're using the same arguably simplistic view where we've got 50 hidden states. Um, we're not using um, insertion states or delete states, which probably would have improved the model. We have too many um, hidden states, which also makes the model a little messy. So that's one of the reasons why the performance doesn't go as well as we'd hoped. Um, now, when we use the Python method only, we had to write uh, definitions for the forward algorithm, the backward algorithm. We had to combine the two to create the von Walsh. Uh, then we had to call the Turby dynamic programming algorithm. So all those had to be prepared. Then we had to initialize, then we had to train the model, model and then we had to do the, the decoding, which is the motif prediction. So these are all of the steps, uh, if you want, um, outlined here that we had to, to build with the Python. And it was a lot of coding. With HMM Learn, instead of all these other things, uh, which is building the bomb walls, the Viterbi, uh, and the initialization, all we have to do is basically initialize, train, and decode. Um, we just have to tell the number of hidden states we want to use. Uh, we call the training function, and then run the decode to predict um, um, the motifs. So this vastly simplifies um, the code um, construction method. So um, just like uh, calling pip to, to bring in TensorFlow, um, we have to install or call pip to bring in HMM Learn. So pip or PIP brings in um, all of those uh, functions or modules. Um, from that HMM Learn, we import HMM, which is the package. Um, we indicate how many states we want to use. So as before with our Python model, we decided on 50 uh, hidden states. I think there's lots to criticize with that, but that's what we went with. Um, and uh, we create this uh, multinomial HMM constructor function. Um, which has a number of components. We call the Viterbi algorithm, the number of iterations. Um, we have to decide um, the amount of data in which we want to train, uh, just like with the fit model, the fit function that we used uh, with the neural net, we could call on this for the selected data set. Um, and we've got uh, our encoded sequences, our training size that we've set, we've chosen how many we're going to put in. So this is uh, essentially how to train the model. Um, there is a forward algorithm, um, which uh, we previously talked about in terms of a hidden Markov model. Um, this uh, defines the forward uh, function um, and it computes the um, alpha table or probabilities that we want. Um, we also have to define the backward one that also computes the, uh, the beta uh, probabilities. Um, and that probably shouldn't say alpha table, it should be a beta table. Um, and so the bomb Welsh, uh, which iterates both A and B, as well as the initial distribution, uses expectation maximization. So those things are, are called um, to generate um, both A and B. 
Um, this is the Viterbi function. Um, and it computes the um, hidden states and generates the sequence of observables. Um, again, in this case, um, mostly code is actually comments rather than, than text code. Um, and then um, we have the HMM initialization, uh, which is described here. So that is the code uh, that we have for uh, HMM. Um, at that stage, uh, we can start testing and validating um, using our test data set. So um, this is uh, the list of uh, probabilities that are produced um, once we've got trained. Um, these are the trained emission probabilities uh, in the different states. Um, so we've got a 50 um, base length um, sequence that we're looking at. So the top line or the top row is state zero. Um, technically, it should be 48 in state 49 rather than state 50. Um, and then what's written in the columns are the probabilities. Um, so at state zero um, or position one, uh, we can run across and we can see that um, 0.548 um, has, is, has the highest probability, um, or A is most likely for that one. Uh, T is most likely for state um, one. Um, G is most likely for state um, uh, two, and so on all the way down. So these are the emission probabilities. We can also take a look at the transition probabilities, and we can also look at the initial state probabilities. Um, from these ones, we can calculate the highest emission probability, and we can return out sort of a list uh, which represents the, the sequence. Now, remember we converted A equals zero, C equals one, G equals two, and T equals three. So what we produce is this numeric array, uh, which we then have to convert to A's, G's, C's, and T's. Um, the decoding is uh, essentially that conversion. Um, converting the integers into the sequence of, of nucleotides. So the HMM learn, which had to calculate the forward algorithm, the backward algorithm, we had to write the, the Turpy algorithm, we had to do lots and lots of stuff. So the actual lines of codes with just Python uh, was almost 350. With HMM learn, uh, it's still about 100 lines of code, so it's not trivially small but it's essentially it's one third the length. And so a lot is saved with um, using HMM Learn. Still, I think as you've seen, there's elements where we have to um, obviously you know, write code to encode things. We have to make sure we call the forward, the backward algorithm because we're essentially um, still training. We're working with unlined uh, sequence data. So there's, there's still the work, um, or if you want, the, the, the logic that you have to be aware of in order to build this. It's not a single line function, which is like you know, an adder or a subtraction, uh, or just call HMM and do some magic. Um, there's still a fair bit of coding with that. In terms of uh, the Python version of HMM Learn, um, it was 98 lines. Um, it runs in about seven seconds. We've written another version in R. Uh, it's a little longer, um, so about 139 lines with 95 lines of coding. And the program runs a little slower. But they all produce um, equivalent results, and they're all reasonably quick. Um, so using HMM Learn, we've been able to take something that was um, rather um, daunting, I guess, in terms of uh, the amount of code uh, that we had to do with, with Python. Uh, we've obviously written it both in Python and in R. Um, and in principle, these can extract um, prokaryote promoter motifs from unaligned sequences. Um, so it doesn't need to have prior multiple sequence alignment. Um, they're generally shorter um, 
the performance is still not great, but the, it's generally a little bit better than the one that was written in pure uh, Python or pure R. Um, as I say, there's, there's a flaw in our concept and our topology design that, that makes this particular um, program perform somewhat less than desired. Um, but I think that's something that we'll be able to work on uh, for next time. So this is really, I guess, wrapping up for, for the lab. Um, we can use maybe the next 10 or 15 minutes for people to, to run through the lab. Um, same thing that uh, we've done before, where you can go to modulate, you can open things up either in Python and R. Um, in this case, you want to upload um, some of the data files. There's two data files. There's the emissions text and the uh, our promoter emissions and the motif sequences that you have to upload. Uh, you can run it the same way you've always done. And then you can play around with um, the different cells as described here um, to, to check things out. So we've tried to make this real. We tried to give you real biological problems, real bioinformatics problems, problems where, you know, hopefully I've given you or the TAs have given you examples of how you could translate that. Um, certainly we've looked at hidden Markov models, which are just really awfully difficult, um, to decision trees, which are much, much simpler, much more rational, and in many cases can do just as well. Uh, we tried to code everything from scratch with a basic Python, just so you can sort of see the under the hood, to look at the engine, to see the nuts, the bolts, and the valves um, as they're pulled apart. Um, you know, some of it's ugly, uh, some of it's scary, but when we've used some of the other modules or libraries that are available, Pandas, NumPy, Sky, Scikit-Learn, Keras, HMN-Learn, I think you can see how the coding is simplified but I think you still fundamentally need to know how to code. Um, it's not, you know, like running a calculator and adding. Um, you still have to be able to know something about the functions, something about the process, um, to make the calls, to know how to run uh, things in loops. Um, so by, you know, giving you code, putting in as many comments as we possibly can to explain the code, hopefully you have got a template that you could use in your own work. The other point I think that I want to highlight is, is to mention that um, uh, our TAs, uh, Life and, and Louisa, are certainly at your beck and call. So if you guys have uh, machine learning problems that you'd like to, to tackle, but you're afraid to, um, get in touch with Life and Louisa. They can probably reuse or show you how to reuse some of the code that we've written for this course uh, to help in, in your own work. Um, at some level, maybe next year, we could try and uh, convert some of the tools that we've been building um, into web servers. Um, and that way people could actually, rather than, you know, having to run the programs all the time, uh, they could just simply upload them. Life and Louisa are currently working on a web server called Wegan, W-E-G-A-N, um, some of which we'll be using um, a, a bit of machine learning, but a lot of multivariate statistics for um, certain types of problems. And, and many of the things that they've developed, uh, including the interface and some of the backend, could probably be adapted to this program. Um, obviously, there are um, types of problems uh, that we've dealt with, like secondary structure prediction, that are really, really specialized. Um, and um, only probably one or two of you would have any deep interest in, in using them. Um, but um, we'll, we'll keep them as that in the sense of their examples. Uh, they show you how to encode, um, how to uh, one-hot encode, which I think is really important. And I think they show you how you can manipulate sequence data to um, help you interpret it. 